Great. So let's get started. Um, so welcome back, uh, everyone, and uh, those of you in the audience who are joining us this week. Um, we have uh, with us this week uh, Clark Barwick. Um, and Clark, it was ni nice to see you in, in the office in person earlier today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you online again tonight. Um, uh, so so uh, Clark's at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and he's, uh, he's giving us uh, a, a, a talk today as, as part of our um, in, in inter introductory or uh, what, what is uh, series um, talking about uh, condensed, uh, aka pycnotic structures, um, a s sort of uh, newish idea or framework um, that's uh, been been used in mathematics and might be useful uh, also in physics. Um, so uh, and also everyone, please feel free to to just ask questions during the talk or, or write write them in the chat chat and we'll pick them up. Um, Clark, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, that, I, and let me reiterate, I mean, I, I um, this is actually the first time that I've ever attended uh, this particular seminar. So I, I, uh, I, I've, I've prepared an extremely gentle introduction. There might be cause for you to tell me that I need to just get on with it and speed up to some more interesting things. So uh, uh, or, or the other way around. So, I mean, please, please talk to me and let me know uh, uh, whether or not this is being pitched about right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm new to this seminar, so I don't quite know how things operate. So please, please keep talking at me. Um, I would really greatly appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to speak about condensed structures. These are also, uh, these were invented by uh, two pairs of people at the same time, roughly. Um, uh, Dustin Clausen and Peter Schulze uh, invented these and called them uh, condensed structures. Peter Hain and I uh, invented what's essentially the same notion, but we called them pycnotic structures. Um, so you might see either one of these two words. Um, uh, let's see, someone asks if I'm meant, if you're meant to be able to see the screen. It, is, is my screen visible? It, it is to me. Is it, is anyone else having a, a trouble? It's with not that? visible to me. Uh oh. Maybe try to slide. Um, uh, do you want to maybe share and uh, yeah, and then <coughs> share and then share again. Yeah, let me try that. I wonder what happened. My apologies. Let's see here. That's not what I wanted. So okay, so let me try to leave and come back. Actually. Ah, I see my Zoom appears to be completely frozen on my iPad. My apologies. Let's give that another try. Um, let's give that one more try here. I don't know what happened. My apologies. Yeah, no worries. Recording in progress. Right. Would you be willing to make me co-host again? I apologize. Thank you. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Is this now visible? Yes. Is, is, is anyone having trouble seeing it now? OK, good. All right. Okay. Please let me know if that happens again. My apologies. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, you, you will see, uh, depending on who's talking, uh, either one of these words perhaps used uh, at different times. Um, and, and but they, they, apart from some sort of set theory issues, which uh, I'll only get into if you make me, um, the, there's no real non-trivial distinction between these two notions. Uh, okay, so but, it, but what I want to do is I want to try to motivate the issue. Um, and I want to motivate it by uh, by sharing with you a kind of slogan, and this is a slogan that I, at least as an undergraduate, was exposed to, and it's it's a slogan that I share with my own undergraduates, uh, which is that if you if you are 
having to deal with a algebraic structure that is in some way infinite, right? So not finitely generated, not a finite type, whatever, then, uh, then those algebraic structures are really gonna be best understood if there's some sort of topological structure present. Um, so, you know, you don't want to be in the business of just trying to uh, classify abelian groups, you know, of, of arbitrary size. That would be an absurd thing to try to do. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to do that. But it does make sense to be able to classify things like locally compact abelian groups. And so this is the kind of idea that, that uh, has, has appeared throughout mathematics. And this is why we have the theory of topological groups, in particular, the locally compact abelian groups. Those are especially nice. Uh, when you have vector spaces over something like R or the complex numbers, or sometimes even over something like QP or something more exotic, then you'll want to be able to speak about uh, infinite dimensional vector spaces, but equipped with some sort of topology. Maybe that topology is induced by a norm or a family of semi-norms or something, but invariably you'll want to have some sort of piece of topological structure there. Um, and and <clears throat> the good news is that 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 Mother Nature is relatively kind in the sense that, that, you know, in order to understand these things, you need to have some topologies present, but in fact, the topologies appear quite naturally in practice. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to understand something like the absolute Galois group or the, the Galois group of an infinite algebraic extension, that has a nat natural profinite topology and you can try to study that. Um, and so this is the, this is the picture. Um, so let me give a very concrete example of this in practice. This is one of my, my favorite theorems. So this, is, this is roughly just gonna be a simple consequence of the Peter Weyl theorem. So we're gonna have a compact group here. And so here we have this sort of nice marriage of, of topology and algebra. And if you happen to have a continuous unitary representation of the G, well, you can decompose that into, into irreducible pieces. And when you decompose that into irreducible pieces, each one of those irreducible pieces is finite dimensional. So this is something that's that's special about compact groups. This compactness here, this is not a this is not a finiteness in the sense of set theory. This is a finiteness in the sense of topology on G. And that finiteness is then sort of turned into a kind of finiteness property for the theory of representations of G. So you can go a little further with this if you want, and you can realize that, that this compact group can actually be recovered from its category of continuous finite dimensional representations. And the way that works is as follows. <clears throat> you, uh, you first contemplate something like the category of finite dimensional representations of G along with the forgetful functor down to vector spaces. So that means that here, what I'm thinking of is I'm thinking of, you know, the collection of all, the collection of all representations, all finite dimensional representations of G. And then I'm just forgetting about the representation part and remembering the vector space part. Now this operation here, this operation takes the tensor product of representations and gives you the tensor product of the underlying vector spaces back. So this operation is an operation that forgets this structure, but it, it, it does keep track of this sort of tensor product on these two categories. And now, well, what can you do? Well, you can look at the automorphisms of this functor of this symmetric monoidal functor. And when you look at the automorphisms of this symmetric monoidal functor, you actually get, well, up to a small detail that I'm going to skip for now, you get a copy of your group G back. In fact, if you are clever about it and you think very hard about how to topologize the collection of automorphisms of this thing, then you even recover G with its topology. And this is a nice example of a situation in which you've got this kind of really cool interaction between sort of topological structures on G in this, in this particular case, a compact group and algebraic structures, uh, in this case, a group structure. And you're talking about these representations, which are all in this case, finite dimensional. 
By the way, this is this is the start of the story in some sense of quantum groups. Right here, these things were sort of fully symmetric monoidal categories that we were contemplating. And the story of quantum groups is in some sense to sort of relax that symmetry and allow instead something like an E2 monoidal structure. So this is a very nice example of where things really work well. Quite yeah, this great wants to know about the detail. Yeah, okay. So this is the detail. The detail is just that here I'm requiring that the that that um that that the, the automorphism be equivalent to its own complex conjugate. That's the only detail that I'm really so I'm I'm only looking at those kinds of automorphisms. Yeah. Um And so this is a situation in which the interaction between the topology and the algebra is really nice, and it really gives you a sort of uh, a, a nice perspective on things. Um, so there are, however, a few issues with this sort with this sort of thing. Um, and maybe the first one, the one that sort of stands out the most, is statements like the isomorphism theorems. These are the sort of theorems that we learn in algebra classes in our undergraduate education. Uh, th these these theorems are false. So, for example. <clears throat> it's not true that if you have a, a map of groups that's both an injective, a map of topological groups that's both an injection and a surjection, then it's an isomorphism of topological groups. And, and it's easy enough to construct examples. So let's do that. So let's contemplate R, the real numbers. Uh, but first I'll contemplate it with the discrete topology. And then I'll contemplate it with its usual topology. And of course, there's a continuous homomorphism going this way, which is definitely an injection, and it's definitely a surjection, but it's definitely not an isomorphism. So this is quite a bad situation from the point of view of an algebraist, because this is going to tell you that if you are interested in sort of any situation in which you might want to study things like exact sequences, of topological abelian groups or topological vector spaces or what have you, then you need some way to rule out this kind of behavior. So one way to rule out this kind of behavior is to say, okay, well, I, I don't think of these kinds of injections, these sorts of injections of any sort, even if they're just continuous injections, I don't think of arbitrary continuous injections as injections. Instead, what I do is I say, well, I, I'm only willing to contemplate closed injections, injections where the image is always something closed. And in that circumstance, you, you, you learn that, for example, a category like the category of locally compact abelian groups, this is not abelian. So you don't have a good theory of kernels and co-kernels, but it's, it's sort of almost good. You have a, you have a quasi abelian category. which is a relatively good situation. This is actually enough to do a little bit of homological algebra, some, but not all homological algebra. Okay. I'm gonna come back to this example and we're gonna, we're gonna unpack it a little more, but first I wanna to get to, to tell you the other issues that I wanna raise here. Well, the other issue here is that exactly exactly this issue starts to produce problems. Homological and homotopical algebra start to become quite subtle and quite fragile in these contexts. So for example, if you want to contemplate something like uh, topological vector spaces over say the complex numbers, then these kinds of issues start to really interfere with the fact that, start to interfere with the fact that you'd like to develop things like homology and cohomology in these situations. So thinking about things like the, uh, you know, if you look at the C infinity uh, maps on a manifold, or maybe even analytic maps on some manifold, these kinds of infinite dimensional vector spaces, doing homological algebra with these things turns out to be kind of a tricky thing. So at the same time, though, if you're interested in something like the BV formalism, you're forced to think about these things. So in ordinary field theory, uh, there's now a pretty good way to try to deal with this sort of thing, um, which uh, shows up in this uh, in this appendix of Costello and William.
Um, and I think they call these things diff differentiable vector spaces. Is that is that the right word? Over say the reals. And this gives you a nice theory and you can start to do homological algebra there and it's pretty well behaved. And this, this is an advantage. One of the disadvantages, however, is that it really is very, very closely tied to the real numbers or the complex numbers. You're very much in this sort of setting. So if what I want to do is I want to sort of transport these ideas into a different context, say into a context where I'd like to work over something more like QP, it's not so clear how to do that from this point of view. It's not clear what a differentiable vector space could even mean in this in the context of, say, the p -addicts. OK, well, there's some more issues. Another issue is that tensor products are, well, in many cases, they don't exist. And in the cases where they do exist, they aren't necessarily very well behaved. Uh, for example, there is no interesting tensor product of locally compact abelian groups. Um, there's a good tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Uh, there's a, a couple of different choices for how you might want to take tensor products of Banach spaces. Uh, tensor products of nuclear vector spaces are really well behaved. But as soon as you start to, to get too far from this kind of very narrow range of options, you start to have increasingly poor behavior of the tensor products. So tensor products of, of tensor products of things like Banach spaces or you know more elaborate, uh, Banach or say Frechet vector spaces is, is a little complex, is complex. So what happens is there are different options for what kind of continuity you ask for. So you, morally what happens is that you, you, you try to write down the universal property of the tensor product and you need to include in that universal property some notion of continuity. And there's a, a few natural options for what that, that natural notion of continuity should be. And in general, they simply don't agree. You don't get the same answers. Okay, well, I can deepen that particular problem by saying that there's, as far as I know, no way to take a topological structure on, on sort of higher categories in this sort of context. So what I mean by that is the following. When you think about something like a field theory in the sort of uh, uh, Atiyah Siegel axiomatics, then what you're thinking about is you're thinking about some sort of assignment that'll take manifolds to various kinds of higher categories. Those various kinds of higher categories are at least supposed to be enriched in some category of vector spaces. Preferably, those should be topological vector spaces at least. And <clears throat> so already there, the tensor product is going to start to interfere and these questions from point three start to interfere. But furthermore, it's not really completely clear what kind of topology you could ask for on these categories. So what does it even mean to speak? What even is a topological higher category? And as far as I know, we, we have no satisfactory answer to that in the language of topology. And so this, this, uh, this mystery of categorification means that it's awfully difficult to try to incorporate something like good topological structures into these stories. Okay, so, so these are some issues. And <clears throat> what condensed or pycnotic mathematics tries to do is it tries to repair these issues by changing the place where you do your algebra. In these contexts, what we're trying to do in effect is we're trying to say, okay, I tried to build the category of vector spaces within the category of topological spaces. And I sort of tried to marry those two structures in that way. And it didn't go so well. Um, and so the idea here is, is that what we're going to try to do now is we're going to try to repair these issues by doing algebra to a category that has all the good formal properties that the category of sets has, but which is itself of a topological nature. That's the strategy here. 
And so the idea is how can you possibly identify a category that, that functions as nicely as the category of sets, but now is an entirely topological creature. So let me just go back to this one example that we were looking at of the reals with the discrete topology and the reals with uh, the usual topology. And let's stare at it for a moment. So let's look at R with the discrete topology and R with its usual topology. <clears throat> and let's think about what the issue here is. So the issue is not with the injectivity of this map. This map ought to be injective. It makes good sense for this to be an injective map. The issue is in thinking that this should have been a surjection. In some sense, this map should not be a surjection. In particular, what should happen is there should be some sort of co-kernel here. Maybe I'll write zero or, or write C for this co-kernel. And here, this co-kernel here, whatever it is, this part of the diagram should be recoverable from this part of the diagram. In other words, I should have some sort of way of taking the reals and forming some very unusual quotient of it, which is no longer just a topological group, but some more elaborate kind of structure. And whatever this map is, it should have the property that when you take its kernel, you recover R with the discrete topology. And so now you can ask, well, what sort of object can this be? And it's not clear, but it is clear that whatever these objects are, they should have underlying abelian groups, right? So, so I don't know what kinds of objects I've written down here, but I know that each of these should have an underlying abelian group. And the underlying abelian group here should be zero. The underlying abelian group of this should be R. The underlying abelian group of this should also be R. And so the underlying abelian group of this should be zero. So what that means is that we should not be looking for a category. We should not be looking for a, a category or, a, or a, a collection of algebraic objects. So it should not be the case. Um, not looking for a, uh, maybe I'll say it like this, a what's called a conservative functor to say abelian groups. And what do I mean that by that? I mean that, that when you take these categories and you forget all the, whatever this magical structure is down to the category of abelian groups, that forgetful process should lose information and it should lose information so that you can have maps that become equivalences on their underlying abelian groups or isomorphisms in their underlying abelian groups that weren't isomorphisms to start with. So this should be a lossy process to go from, from this world, whatever it is, down to the category of abelian groups. Another way of saying that is saying that, well, you can think of the underlying abelian group as a, as a kind of a coarse estimate for how big your object actually is. You can think of that as a very coarse estimate for how big your object actually is. And that in fact, this object here should be quite large. It's just that it's not very large through the eyes of its underlying abelian group. Okay, so where can that information be stored? <clears throat> So I want to go back to an even more primitive example in the following way. So suppose that you have a reasonable topological space. And unless you make me, I'm not going to say what reasonable means. But if you have a reasonable topological space, then uh, it can be recovered from a functor. And what functor is that? Well, it's going to be a functor valued in sets on the category of compact Hausdorff spaces. So comp is my notation for compact Hausdorff spaces. Compact Hausdorff spaces are sort of the best topological spaces we have lying around if we're doing general topology. And I can ask myself, well, <clears throat> if I just consider the maps from some arbitrary compact topological space, K, let's call it, 
into my x. If my x is a well-behaved topological space, then this assignment will suffice to recover x. Right? You can learn everything you need to learn about x. I mean, you can certainly learn its underlying points just by making k the point. Right, So that tells you the underlying set. And then, well, maybe what I want to say in addition to that is that I want to say that a set here is open if and only if its pre-image in all of these compact Hausdorff spaces is open. So for those of you who know, I guess I'm going to tell you what the reasonable means after all. Uh, it, this is the notion of a compactly generated topological space. So if X is a reasonable topological space, then I can, in some sense, forget about the topological space and just remember what it does to compact Hausdorff spaces, what it means to map a compact Hausdorff space into it. And if I retain that information, then that's good enough to remember my reasonable topological space. By the way, reasonable really does include the vast majority of topological spaces we all think about. You have to go some distance to produce a topological space that isn't compactly generated. So I'm just going to kind of be funny here. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'd like to ask a pretty dumb question here. So sure. are, does any functor from uh, compact Hausdorff to set correspond to an X? Definitely not. Okay, so we're we talking These... something about what kind of functors you're, you're talking about, right? That's exactly right. I'm going to need to narrow my options here. That's right. Yeah, these these functors are special. These, these functors have certain properties. I mean, here's a simple example of something that these these functors have. So, for example, if I look at maps from the empty set into X, I'm always going to get a point. That's kind of a silly example, but it's it's that's a real phenomenon, right? <laughs> and you can imagine functors that don't do this, but this one does. So this is something special about these kinds of functors. That's right. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a list soon of things that the, of properties that this functor has that are that are exceptional. Did I did I answer your question? Are you, are you happy with that? Ah, uh, yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna be kind of cheeky, and I'm gonna write x of blank for this functor, which is a little perverse. But I, it's a sort of thing that comes from thinking about algebraic geometry. In algebraic geometry, when you've got a scheme and you want to talk about the R points of that scheme, then you write this kind of expression. But what this really means is that you've looked at maps from spec R into your scheme. So what I'm doing is I'm starting to think like an algebraic geometer about this bit of topology. OK, so now. I need to do a better job of answering this question. So what kinds of properties do the functors that come from here have? And how can I, how can I single out the good features of these kinds of functors? And I mentioned one thing already, which is that if you map out of the empty set, there's only one map out of the empty set. So that's a good property. And there's, there's a couple more. So here's that property again. X of the empty set is a point. That's a good property. Another good property, which is kind of a, if you like, a generalization of this one, is that, you know, if I try to map out of a disjoint union of two topological spaces, K disjoint union L into X, then this breaks up, right? If I want to write a continuous map from here to here, then I can just write a map from here to here and a map from here to here, and those will fit together. So I, I see that this is the formula that I have. X seems to carry disjoint unions, finite disjoint unions, to products of sets. That's what these first two conditions say. And then there's one more condition here, and there's this, this, this third condition here, and I want to talk about this condition. So let's have a look at what's happening here. So the situation is the following. So suppose, I'm going to put this aside for a second, suppose that what I have is I have a closed equivalence relation on my favorite compact Hausdorff space S. I have a closed equivalence relation on this compact Hausdorff space. If I have a closed equivalence relation, then I'm entitled to form a quotient, S mod R, which will be another compact Hausdorff space because of the closedness of it. And I want to understand the relationship of the S mod R points of X. In other words, the maps from S mod R into X 
to the maps from S into X? Well, one thing I know is that if I formed this quotient, then if I wanted to say what it is to give a map from here into X, then I'd say it's the same thing as giving a map from here into X that sends R equivalent points to the same point in X. That's the, if you like, that's the universal property of the formation of the quotient in compact house door spaces. So if I wanted to write down a continuous map from S mod R, S mod this equivalence relation to X, then that's the same thing as saying that I'm going to write down a map from S into X, but with a certain property, right? So that means that I'm identifying, and I'll say what the property is in a second, but first let me just say that I'm going to say that maps from SR into X, this is forming a subset of the maps from S into X. And what subset is it? It's the subset of things that, that it's the subset of maps that think that our equivalent points should go to the same place. Okay, so what does that mean? <clears throat> well, I can look at R and <laughs> excuse me. And while I can, this is this is the this is the set of pairs that are equivalent under this equivalence relation, right? That's how equivalence relations work in this context. And so this is the set of pairs x comma y where x is equivalent to y under this relation. And I can project onto x or onto y, either one. So that gives me two maps going like that. And these two maps here, because I've got a functor, these two maps here are going to induce maps from x of s to x of r. There's two different ones. And that's what this map here is. This is the map that goes from x of s to x of r by the first projection. And it goes here by the second projection. Okay, and what am I saying here? I'm saying that those two points, those two maps ought to go to the same place over here. And that's the only condition I need to know that a map from S into X factors through S mod R into X. So in other words, the set of maps here like this consists of exactly those maps from S to X that think that these two long composites are the same. In other words, again, this diagram here, this little square is what's called a pullback. Namely, identifying a point of this set is the same thing as identifying a point here and a point here that agree down here. Where this here, I'm sorry, this here is the diagonal map. This is just the diagonal. Okay, so that's a kind of a funny condition, but if you've seen this sort of thing before, this might look a little bit familiar. This is a, an example of what's called a sheaf condition. Right? This is actually a sheaf condition. Now, you might not be very happy with this because it might seem quite abstract. I mean, how would you ever check this in practice, right? This sounds like a dangerous place to be. And, and to some extent, you're right. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to fix that soon. But nevertheless, we now have a definition. Uh, what's the backwards L? What's the backwards L in the diagram? Oh, 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 yeah, sorry. This is, this is, I don't even know that this is the right notation. I think I do this wrong. But it, this is my notation for the, the statement, this is a pullback. So this isn't just a commutative square, but this is exactly the set of things that makes this commute. Um, so this is my notation for the pullback. This is saying that this is the fiber product of this with this over this. That's what's supposed to be happening there. Okay, so John thinks it's the right notation, so it must be the right notation. That's how that works. <laughs> I, I, I see other people put it in another place. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so this is the, this is, I've, I just got in the habit of doing this all the time. Um, Okay, so this is the, the kind of property, and this is some sort of sheaf condition here. And so that entitles us, entitles us to actually give a definition. Here's the definition. A pycnotic set is nothing more than a sheaf on the site of compact house door spaces where the topology 
is given by quotients, by the formation of quotients. Now, this is an extremely abstract way to describe this structure. And so I, I, it, it's okay if you're not familiar with, with how sheaves on sites work, because I want to unpack this a little bit anyway. But this is the idea. The idea is that the data of a pycnotic set, what do I have to give you to give you a pycnotic set? I have to give you for every compact Hausdorff space, K, say, I have to give you a set, X of K, and I have to do that contravariantly. And I have to do it in such a way that the empty set goes to the one point set so that disjoint unions of compact spaces go to products of sets. And so that when you have a, a, uh, a surjection of compact house door spaces, which is always a quotient map, then you get a nice formula for how the, the points of the quotient sit inside points of the whole space. Okay, so this is a, a formula, but it, once again, we're still having this little issue or a definition, but once again, we're having this little issue, which is that how would you ever check that this thing really is a sheaf? How are you going to check this sheaf condition in practice? If I just write something down and hand it to you, there's a lot to check here. And it might be nicer to, to write down a little bit less in the first place. I mean, there's a lot of compact house door spaces out there. Maybe we could write down fewer compact house door spaces. So let me explain how to do that, but maybe now is a good time to pause and ask if there are questions yet. This is quite abstract, but I'm about to make it more concrete, but silence. How does this uh, differ from like the standard UNITA philosophy of like, you know, um, this functor like determines the object up to unique isomorphism? It's, it's exactly the usual UNATA philosophy. That's exactly right. So the usual UNATA philosophy says that, uh, the, the usual UNATA philosophy says that, you know, if you've got an object of your favorite category, then you're entitled to look at the functor that it represents, right? So this is the, this is the thing that carries, this is the functor that carries Y to the set of maps in C from Y to X. And knowing what this is, is sufficient to recover X. That's exactly the Yoneda philosophy. And so if I've got a topological space, I could, if I wanted to, think about a functor defined on the entire category of topological spaces. But in some sense, the whole message of the first part of the talk was that, well, there's too many topological spaces. I don't want to have to contend with all of them if I don't, if I don't have to. And it would, be hand, it would be handy if I could cut them down to some reasonable, nice, small collection of topological spaces, the things that I like. So the things I like are compact house door spaces. So I chose to cut them down in that way. And But that's exactly right. I mean, I've taken this sort of big thing, this thing that's defined on all topological spaces, and I've cut it down to just the compact house door spaces. And then I've said, okay, well, what features do I really like about those functors? And what I decided I really liked is the fact that this thing is a sheaf. Now, for those of you who, who know what the following words mean, let me just say the following, which is the, the sheaf, the, the fact that I'm trying to reduce to a category of sheaves is part of the whole story here. So I said at the beginning that I wanted to try to, to do algebra relative to a different category than the category of sets. And I wanted to do it with the category that had some sort of topological nature. But what does it mean to say that it's a category that functions as, as well formally as the category of sets? Well, sheaf categories function really, really well. They function almost as well as the category of sets. They have nice internal HOMs, so you can talk about the sheaf HOM from one object to another. They have, you know, uh, uh, good equivalence, they have a good theory of equivalence relations, so that functions really nicely. Those kinds of properties are things that I really, really like about the category of sets. And I'm really going to want those things to underlie whatever kind of algebra I build on top of that. And so that's why I was keen to make sure that I had a sheaf condition at the end of the day. Okay. 
So I'm still a little unhappy with this story. Why am I unhappy? Because there's just too many compact health store spaces out there. There's really a boatload of compact health store spaces. <laughs> and so maybe I can try and cut down how much information I'm writing. It turns out I can. And in the process, what I'll discover is that not only do I get to cut down the amount of information I'm writing, but the conditions that I've given, these three hypotheses here, these three salient properties, I can essentially get rid of the third one altogether. Okay, well, how can I get away with that? Well, the idea here is the following. The idea is that, well, I've said that something good happens anytime I have a quotient, right? In some sense, the value of X on this quotient space is determined by the value on, on the total space, on S itself, and some information about the relations. So if what I can learn is that every compact house store space is the quotient of something reasonable or some value of reasonable, then I can arrive at a simpler collection of objects that I can define my functor on. And if I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll improve myself. So let's see if I can do that. And here's the observation. <clears throat> The observation is that every compactum, every compact house door space is a quotient of a free compactum. <laughs> so you might not be familiar with free compacta. Uh, if you happen to have taught general topology in the last uh, couple of years, then you might remember what this means. But if you haven't, then let me tell you now. So what happens is the following. Let's say that I've got a set. S is just a set right now. And I have a compact house door space K. And I have a map from S to K. This is just a set map at the moment. There's no topology on S, so it wouldn't mean anything for, the, for me to say anything about continuity. But what I'd like, and this is a little perverse, but what I'd like is I'd like a compact house door space that I'll call beta of S that will contain my original S and such that if I've got just a map and this containment, then I can always extend in a unique way. So this is gonna be a compact house door space and this map is gonna be continuous. In other words, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take random sets that I've just got lying around and turn them into compact house door spaces. It turns out you can always do this. This is a process called the stone check compactification. In my topology courses, I never quite get to being able to, to talk about the stone check compactification, but um, uh, I really wish I could. Oh, John's got a question. Uh, I'm using condensed and pycnotic uh, interchangeably, but didn't closet and also use a rather different looking site? Yes, absolutely. They're using a smaller site than the site of all compacta, but the, way they're, the reason that they're gonna be able to get away with that is because of this, this helpful observation. So it does turn out to be, uh, a completely equivalent definition apart from some set theory, which isn't isn't the issue here. Um, there's a small issue involving set theory just because the category of compact house door spaces isn't a small category. So you have to you have to decide what you're going to do about that. Um, but modulo that small issue. Oh, sorry, compactum is my this is a bad habit of mine. Compactum for me equals compact house door space. I should probably uh, just say that, but yeah, um, yeah. So there, there is a there is a different uh, there is a different site, and I'm about to move to that slightly different site. So, um, and and the key point here is is this fact this fact that every compact house store space is actually a quotient of one of these bizarre free things. Now let me emphasize that that uh, these are extremely peculiar topological spaces. Uh, these are not the kinds of topological spaces you think of as your friends. 
uh, these things are very, very strange. Uh, so for example, uh, these, these kinds of topological spaces, they're, they're totally disconnected topological spaces. They are compact in Hausdorff, uh, but they have very peculiar properties. So for example, it's the case that, uh, that the closure of every open is still open. Of an open is still open. So this is telling you that these, these spaces, in some sense, they're very, very odd spaces. They have a lot of clopen sets inside them. Um, too many, one might say. But nevertheless, they're quite nice from this point of view, from the point of view of mapping out of them. Mapping into them is a nightmare, but mapping out of them is a nice thing to do. Because mapping out of this beta of S with a continuous map is just the same thing as writing down a set map from S into K. So this is the stone check compactification. And in some sense, these beta of S's, these things function like the free compact Hausdorff spaces. This is, you should think of this as the sort of compact Hausdorff space that's freely generated by the set S. Because this is in perfect analog with the way sort of the free group generated by a set is constructed. Or the, rather the universal property of the free group. <laughs> Excuse me. So the stone check compact, <clears throat> excuse me, one sec. So these free things are especially nice. <clears throat> and one reason they're even more uh, wonderful than usual is, well, let's think about what happens when we have one of these equivalence relations on them. Actually, you know what? I'll just move on to a new page. So let's think about what happens when you have one of these equivalence relations on them. So suppose that you wrote down some, um, suppose that you wrote down a surjection from beta of S to beta of T. So suppose that I did that. Suppose I wrote down a surjection from one of these three things to another one of these three things. And we asked what happened. So I took beta of S and I quotiented it out by some equivalence relation and I got another free thing. It's just a, just a funny thing that happened. Well, <clears throat> you can ask, well, what happens here? So uh, I can, from this, I can write down, this, this map here is determined by just a set map from S to beta of T. And well, <clears throat> I don't know more about this map, but it just exists. On the other hand, I know that this is a surjection. So I know that if I put T inside here, then every element of T is hit by this map. So I can just freely choose sections of this thing. And that therefore extends to a continuous map because of this freeness property. What that means here is that every time you have a surjection between two of these free things, that surjection admits a section. I can always form a section of any of these things. And that's just from the fact that these things are all kind of free. It's very, very easy to choose these things. So that means in some sense, anytime you have an equivalence relation on one of these free things that gives you another free thing, this thing is actually breaking up into pieces, into disjoint unions. And so when I'm trying to think about this sheaf condition that I was writing down for these arbitrary surjections of compact Hausdorff spaces, if I restrict attention to the, just the free things, everything splits up. What that entitles me to do is it entitles me to write down the following very simple definition. This is a redefinition of the notion of a pycnotic set. And this will address John's question, which is, you know, hey, don't Clausen and Schultz write down a different definition? And they do. And this is roughly what they write down. They say, well, a pycnotic set is a functor from the category of, of free compact Hausdorff spaces. These are the free compact. These are the things of the form beta of S op into sets such that, and now it's just these two conditions that I have to write down. 
And now these two conditions, this is far more, this is far less taxing on my intelligence, right? I, I can actually think about how to prove these things in practice. It's a little frustrating that the, the free things that I have to write down are quite exotic, but nevertheless, I, I really do have a very easy way to check whether these things are true. And you can really expect to do that. <clears throat> okay, so that's a, a new definition of a pycnotic set which is a little bit simpler, have us fewer objects and fewer conditions, so that's good. And now I wanna try and argue that this is really a, a reasonable thing to do. This is gonna be something that we're really gonna be happy with. So I need to show you some examples that will convince you, I hope that this is actually not a bad idea. But before I go on with that, what questions do you have? Um, I have a question. So, yes. um, so going back to your example of, um, R with the discrete topology. Are you saying that is R with the discrete topology a pycnotic set? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's look at how that works. So if I think of R with the discrete topology, well, then how is it a pycnotic set? Well, I want to say that the K points for any compactum K are the continuous maps from K into R with the discrete topology. So what does this mean? If I'm looking at continuous maps from this compact Hausdorff space into R with a discrete topology, well, what does that mean that I'm doing? That means that I'm looking at locally constant maps on K. Right, so this is the set of locally constant maps on K, or locally constant functions, I should say. And now by the same token, we can think of R with the usual topology. And here, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to think about maps from K into R. Well, these are, you know, these are just usual continuous functions on K. And so here we have the embedding of locally constant functions on K into all continuous functions on K. And now you start to see that, well, wait a minute, if I just kind of think naively for a second here, I could just ask what happens when I take the quotient of these continuous functions by these locally constant functions. I can just form that quotient in the category of abelian groups. So let's try it. So I'm gonna take maps from K into R, modulo the locally constant ones. So these are the continuous ones, and these are the locally constant ones. So these are the continuous functions modulo the locally constant functions. And of course, when k is a point, when k is a point, there's no difference, right? Because you can't do much with the point. It's, you're just going to have to choose a constant map. But if k is interesting, if k is something like the Cantor space, then these two are pretty different, right? There's plenty of continuous maps that aren't locally constant. And this quotient becomes non-trivial. And so now suddenly we're starting to see the possibility for actually having non-trivial quotients of things like R delta into R. Right? If we think of these things as, as locally constant functions or sorry, continuous functions modulo the locally constant functions, then we have a whole family of interesting maps here. And this thing is indeed a really big group if K is an interesting topological space. It's just that when we pass to the underlying object, that is to say, when we made K a point, we lost that distinction. We lost track of that information. So this is a good excuse now for me to mention that uh, that's the notion of an underlying thing. So the pycnotic set is a functor like this. And so now I can also define I can also define uh, uh, the underlying thing. So the underlying uh, set. <laughs> of X is, well, it's X applied to the one point topological space. 
And so this defines uh, an operation that takes a pycnotic set and just extracts the underlying set. But this is that lossy operation that I was describing, right? This is the thing that takes a uh, uh, something with this, this kind of rich topological structure and just tries to extract the underlying set sitting inside it. And this is a very, very lossy map, as we see in this example. This, this object exactly shows that. Clark, you, you've just got a few minutes of official time left. Um, yeah. How, how do you feel about wrapping up? But then we can have as Absolutely. much discussion afterwards as, <clears throat> as people like. Uh, well, so it, I'm, I think that's great. So I've, I've mentioned, I've actually already mentioned these two examples, but I'll mention them again. So every reasonable topological space now falls into this paradigm. Every reasonable topological space is an example of a pycnotic set. And I've also talked about this, where we can take R and quotient out by R with the discrete topology and actually get something new and interesting. So those are the those are the two examples. And maybe I just want to mention one more interesting example. I mentioned this problem of categorification. And I mentioned that that you know we have this issue that that we don't even really meet, know what it means to talk about a topological category in any meaningful way. But in this context, there's no real problem. In this context, everything's perfectly fine. If R is a pycnotic ring, for example, if it's your favorite topological ring like R or C or QP, then if I look at the category of R modules, this is supposed to be the word then, but okay. Uh, then if I look at the category of R modules, then it just inherits for at no cost whatsoever, a uh, pycnotic structure. There's nothing to say about this. It just happens. And so this is one of the big advantages of this is that that sort of formal constructions are just sort of brought along for the ride. Anytime you have something formal that you want to do, the pycnotic structure is there to help you. Okay, this is a good time for me to stop. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so, uh, questions? Please just unmute. Oh no, the silence. Clark, is a pycnotic set a symmetric monoidal functor? Is that what those two conditions amount to? Uh yeah, they they that's one way to say it. Yeah, the the it it carries the yeah, it carries the the this symmetric monoidal structure to this symmetric monoidal structure. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Totally. Um, it was a good I, question, but it was too easy to answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a technical thing on this slide: when when you say pycnotic category, you you mean it in, enriched in pycnotic sets. Uh, I could mean, mean that, the, but I... the category itself has some topology on it. Yeah, the category itself has some topology on it. That's right. So I'm I'm saying that there's that the mod R. So I, I've been talking mostly about pycnotic sets, but I I don't have to. I can talk about pycnotic things in any category where I have products, including the category of categories. So I could talk about a functor like that, <laughs> satisfying the same sort of condition. And that's a, indeed the natural structure that you have on the category of R modules. You have this pycnotic structure, essentially at no cost. So one of the initial ex examples you started with were um, in infinite dimensional topological vector spaces. Mm -hmm. um, things like, like s s smooth functions on a space. Yeah. Um, um, how 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 do those become pycnotic, and <clears throat> and and how how does it help us think about them? Yeah. Um, so right. So if you have a, a an infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, say a topological vector space, then once again, you've got this sort of property that topological vector spaces give rise to, let's say over R, they give rise to pycnotic vector spaces over R. Pycnotic objects in this category of vector spaces. And the thing that's nice about this category, <clears throat> so this, you know, this category has, um, 
has all the problems that I named, right? It's not an abelian category. It's not got a reasonable notion of tensor products, et cetera, et cetera. This category suffers from none of these defects, right? This category is an abelian category. Uh, it does have good homological properties. You can do all the homological algebra you can think of in here. And there's even a good tensor product. Now, I'm sweeping a little bit under the rug when I say that, because in fact, you you know, in the same way that you don't work with arbitrary topological vector spaces, you don't work with arbitrary pycnotic vector spaces here either. You want to cut down the size of things to something a little more, a little more understandable. But uh, it, you really can just simply work with this object. In particular, you can do the following. I could also look at pycnotic objects in the derived infinity category of vector spaces over R. And in this, this is a this is in some sense capturing all of the homological algebra that you could possibly want to do here. And so this is a this is an advantage. It's also an advantage because it the the R here is now essentially a it's just a decoration. I could replace this with any reasonable topological ring. And I could, it, you, this functions in exactly the same way it, at some very basic formal level. So let me see if I understand this. So um, the, the pycnotic, you're talking about the category of pycnotic vector spaces over R. And so a pycnotic vector space over R would be a functor from three vector spaces op to vector space, I say, okay. Um, yeah, free, free, free compact. Satisfying your two axioms. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. And yeah. when you write pick of vect R, you mean the category of those functors. That's right. Whose exactly. objects are those functors. And the morphisms are supposed to be obvious? The morphisms are the natural transformations of these things. That's okay. right. That's right. But are you saying that the theory of like tensor products of nuclear vector spaces and all that, that this sheds light or makes it easier in some sense? Does it make it easier? Or nuclear um, maps, the kind of thing that you would encounter in say Wick rotated field theory. That's right, yeah. So uh, it, I, I think it makes it easier from the point of view of homological algebra, for sure. Uh, so I think it makes it a lot easier to figure out what the derived tensor product ought to be. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, uh, um, but in terms of the, uh, I mean, you, you certainly can capture it. The, the question of whether or not, um, whether or not it makes it easier at the abelian category level, I'm not really sure I have, I'm not convinced of that. I think, you know, <laughs> I don't think it would make, give you an improvements in that case. Um, okay. Thanks. um, it's uh, so. Let's see. Theo asked a question. I want to try to address, which is that uh, that that uh, there's a question about whether or not this this uh, formal nonsense actually helps us do something. Um, so that's a good question. So the the um, so yes and no. Um, so I mean, from my point of view. So let me let me give you a concrete example that was the reason for me trying to come up with it in the first place. And, and then we'll see whether you're convinced. And if you're not, I'll try and think of another example. Um, so uh, the situation for me, the way this arose for me was the following. So I was interested in the following scenario, which is not perhaps a very physical scenario, but I'm, I'm going to have to tell you this anyway. Uh, so for me, I was contemplating the situation where you have a scheme <clears throat> X or variety or something like that. And I was interested in trying to understand uh, the category of constructible sheaves on X. And now in, in algebraic geometry, we often think of the category of constructible sheaves valued in something like, uh, uh, well, what you'd like to be able to say is you'd like to be able to say constructible sheaves valued in say QL bar vector spaces. This is the kind of thing that, that uh, shows up, you know, this is, these are the kinds of sheaves that show up in the proof of the Vey conjectures, for example. Right. But the actual construction of this that appears in uh, whatever SGA, whatever it is, 
um, the actual construction of this thing is, is really complicated. In particular, there isn't really a coefficient category that you work with. Instead, what you do is you do something kind of elaborate. You instead try to take constructible sheaves valued in Z mod L to the N sheaves and the, uh, Z mod L to the N modules. And then you, you take a limit over the L to the Ns and then you take a co-limit to get out to the, the QL coefficients. And so in particular, the, the category that you end up with is not a category of sheaves in any sense. <laughs> it's a very frustrating thing. And that meant always that that you know everything you did there was always this kind of wrenching around of things. And well, in our particular case, what we were very interested in was we were very interested in trying to classify these in the same way that you work with the exit path category in manifold theory or with stratified manifolds. So we wanted to be able to write down a formula that says that this is the same thing as functors out of something which is like the exit path category of X into, again, something, which should be the derived category of QL vector spaces, QL bar vector spaces. Now, in order to make sense of this, in order to even write down this in a sensible way, we had to introduce some sort of extra structures on these things. Namely, if I look at the derived category of QL bar, this thing needs to have some topological structure in this case, a pycnotic structure that comes from the fact that QL bar is a topological ring. That's something that we now have access to. But even more than that, when I look at the category, when I look at the exit path category in algebraic geometry, it's not sufficient for me to just have a raw abstract category. I have to have a category with some additional structure. In fact, in practice, it's a sort of a profinite structure. And so then I need to be able to make sense of the idea of continuous functors. So here, when I write fun, I should really be writing continuous functors from this profinite category into this pycnotic category. And I simply wanted to make sense of this statement. And this exactly gives you the way of doing that. So the pycnotic structure for us, we were simply trying to make sense of this exact kind of sentence. And so this is the same kind of thing that you see all the time in, in manifold theory, or uh, maybe I want to say like stratified topology, but transported into the context of algebraic geometry. And so this, is, this was the reason that we had for coming up with it. Now, this is different from the purposes of Klaus and Schultze, but I, uh, well, I'm the one giving the talk, so I get to talk about my thing. And Claire, just so we touch on this, um, do you think you could say a little bit about um, how how you envision this appearing in, in field theory? Yeah. So, uh, well, so the the short answer is, of course, that I don't know because I, I my interest is is uh, has really been in trying to understand how uh, uh, how uh, field theories can be transported into the context of, of arithmetic geometry. So this is some ideas that Mignon Kim has been uh, advertising. And the, the rough idea is the following. So <clears throat> when you when you think about when you think about spec Z, what you're supposed to think about is you're supposed to think about a three manifold. And that three manifold has inside it various embedded knots. I can't draw any knots that aren't the unknot, so I'll just draw that. Um, and so this is these these correspond to individual primes, like spec FP. Um, now, what you're permitted to do here in this in this analogy, what you're permitted to do here is you're permitted to thicken up that knot, and then just look at the sphere bundle over that knot. So you take a what some the, the deleted tubular neighborhood of that knot. That deleted tubular neighborhood sort of functions like a, a surface, a Riemann surface, embedded inside this three manifold. And so this has been the story, and that, that roughly corresponds to the field QP. So spec of QP kind of acts like a sort of knotted torus sitting inside this three manifold. Now this has always just been kind of a uh, sort of 
daydream, you know, just sort of a cute story that you could tell people. But recently, uh, with the work of Schulze and Farg, this has become something that you can actually write down in a in a real way. It's not just a homotopy type or something, but it's something that has actual points. And the that thing is called the Farg Fontaine curve. So the Farg Fontaine curve really now functions like a Riemann surface. And because it functions like a Riemann surface, you can actually try to do geometric Langlands on this Riemann surface. And that's exactly what Farg and Schultz do in this very long paper that they put out a couple of years ago. So a natural thing to ask now, if, if you like this sort of circle of ideas is, you know, can you make sense of things like uh, 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 chiral algebras in this sort of context? Um, so for example, for, for those sorts of things, you're gonna need to work with various kinds of coefficients and those coefficients are gonna need to all have topological structures. They're gonna have like QL structures and things like this. So the pycnotic stuff is just embedded into the basic underlying structure of this story. In fact, I mean, even the, even this object itself, this object itself is a, a scheme, but the, you know, when you think of the R points, what kind of thing is R? It's not just an ordinary ring, but it's now a, a ring with some extra topological structure. And the best way to encode that once again is through this pycnotic structure story. So, it, you know, in some sense, it's it's baked into every single part of this, this, this attempt to try to make local Langlands, the Langlands over QP, something that is actually a form of geometric Langlands over this rather exotic looking curve. So it's, it's, you know, it's really baked into the story in some strong sense. <laughs> so a, a slogan might be arithmetic geometric language? Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, um, well, it, it, I have to be very careful with that now, right? Because there's this other version of arithmetic geometric language where you work with a function field instead of something like QP. Um, and so the, there's this whole version of uh, by uh, a large number of authors. Someone help: Gates, Gorey, Farshavsky, Raskin, usual suspects, I think. Um, and uh, uh, and that's that's over a function field. That's over you know, but that's over that's over a function field. But here we're we're working over something like QP, and this you really have to pass to this sort of weird analytic setting to even make sense of that kind of structure. Um, and all of these things, I mean, all of these objects are naturally built out of these rings that have all this strange pycnotic structure in them. So even though, I mean, Theo's right, I mean, but most of this talk has been an extremely sort of formal description of things and sort of at a very, very basic level, but there's, there's really non-trivial stuff to do with these things at least in the sort of world of, of analytic geometry, p-adic analytic geometry. Theo, are you happy with that answer or do you want me to give you another one or try to give you another one? You're happy, okay, good. If you're happy, I'm happy. We should probably let Clark go soon. Oh, uh, I have one more question. Why, why the choice of words pycnotic and condensed? So uh, this is another another instance of, of us thinking in very similar ways. So I, mean, I should say for the record that I think Dustin Clausen knew about this stuff long before I even started thinking about it. I mean, I think this was already in his head when he was a PhD student. But <clears throat> the idea was roughly the following. The idea was that you sort of imagine sets are just sort of bags of particles with no real structure. And then passing to condensed sets is sort of letting these things kind of coagulate in various ways. And so they're becoming condensed and they start to have this kind of profinite sort of topological structure. And pycnotic is basically the exact same idea, except that pycnotic, what happens in, in in certain kinds of cell death is that the cells will undergo what's called pycnosis, where they kind of draw into each other, in, draw into themselves and become more solid. I see, it comes from biology. 
it comes from biology. That's right. Um, so, but it's 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 really. I mean, we're we're imagining still the same mechanism um, from the story. Well, uh, thanks so much again, um, Thank and thank thanks to the audience. That um, that that was a really beautiful talk. Thank you very uh, much. Th thanks for introducing the subject again. Thank you. My pleasure. And if, if anyone wants to talk about this, I'm always, I'm always willing. <laughs> yeah, Cheers. That, that was awesome. Um, Thanks, Clark. Great uh, talk. Thank you. Um, if everyone have a good afternoon, evening, and, and fortnight, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Cool. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs>